Uh, I would like to introduce Jonathan Shan, uh, who will be presenting his paper, Freud's Occult Science, Metaphor, Transference, and Transformation. Uh, Jonathan Shan uh, read English at Cambridge, trained as a lawyer, then worked in private practice until 2016. He took an MSc in Theoretical Psychoanalytic Studies with distinction at UCL and is now a PhD candidate in UCL's Psychoanalysis Unit. His research area is Freud and Metaphor. Jonathan, uh, the screen is yours. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes, great, we can hear you and see you. Great, um, I will just try and share my screen. Yes, thank you very much then, Brennan, and thank you, Faith and Misha, and thank you all. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, so here's a picture of Freud, not looking very happy at the title, Freud's Occult Science. Now, while Jung is widely recognized as a key figure in esoteric circles, Freud is not. Jung's influence on, for example, contemporary astrology, the alchemical revival, neo-Gnosticism, neo-paganism, transpersonal psychology and the new age are all well established. By contrast, Freud is popularly seen as a reductionist critic of religion, mysticism and esotericism, the positivist father whom Jung the mystic had to overthrow. Yet Freud's attitude to esotericism was much more nuanced, ambivalent and conflicted than is sometimes allowed. <clears throat> Freud's friend, disciple and biographer, Ernest Jones, uh, who's there in the back row in the middle of the photo, uh, himself firmly skeptical about all things esoteric, began his detailed review of Freud and occultism by finding an exquisite oscillation between scepticism and credulity. He obliquely links this to another of Freud's eccentricities, namely his championing of the theory of the wonderfully named J. Thomas Looney that Shakespeare's plays were actually written by Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford. The common thread, Jones argues, is that despite Freud's great independence of mind and skeptical criticism of ideas, he also had a concealed vein of its very opposite, that is, a susceptibility to others' influence, which he defended against by an assertive resistiveness. An interest in seances and telepathy was widespread among the pioneers of psychology, for example, William James, Frederick Myers, Theodore Flournoy, and Pierre Janet, as well as Jung and other early psychoanalysts, as we heard yesterday, of course, from Ninian and Jonas. The entanglement between the occult and psychology extends much further back through hypnotism to mesmerism, through suggestion to demonic possession, to rituals of healing and to exorcism. Freud's fascination with the occult, for example, seances, telepathy, numerology, magical thought and action, the doppelganger motif, precognition, and his superstitious fears of and apotropaic rituals against his own expected death or that of a loved one are well attested as is his anxiety that the esoteric enthusiasms of colleagues such as Ferenzi, Jung, Steckel and Silberer might undermine the scientific credibility of psychoanalysis. He famously wrote in 1921, and then forgetting in 1929, denied that he had written, if I had my life to live over again, I should devote myself to psychical research rather than to psychoanalysis. On the other hand, and at least as notoriously, Jung very late in life reported that Freud had once said to him, my dear Jung, promise me never to abandon the sexual theory. That is the most essential thing of all. You see, we must make a dogma of it, an unshakable bullock. The bullock had to be erected, Freud said, against the black tide of mud. And here he hesitated for a moment, then added, of occultism. What Freud, according to Jung, meant by occultism was virtually everything that philosophy and religion, including the rising contemporary science of parapsychology, had learnt about the psyche. This conversation probably took place about the same time as, or within a few days of, another momentous encounter, which occurred on the evening of March the 25th, 1909. 
On this occasion, Jung sought to persuade the skeptical Freud about the reality of occult phenomena. Freud's dismissal of Jung's arguments was interrupted by a sudden explosive crack from Freud's bookcase, which Jung immediately attributed to what he called a catalytic exteriorization phenomenon. Freud retorted, that is sheer bosh. But Jung predicted a second loud report would follow and promptly it did. Freud was pretty weirded out by all this. In a follow-up letter to Freud two and a half weeks later, Jung referred to this performance somewhat apologetically as my spookery. Freud's reply four days later is a nuanced, psychologizing but conflicted rebuttal in which he tells Jung how he felt about this poltergeist business. He rationalizes the coincidence, observing that any willingness to, sorry, that my willingness to believe vanished with the magic of your personal presence thus both affirming and undercutting Jung's wizardry by re reframing occult mana as personal charisma. He reveals that the incident occurred on the same evening when he had formally adopted Jung as his successor and crown prince, and implies that Jung's stories and experiment constituted an edible attack on Freud, uh, on Freud's paternal dignity. He admits his ambivalence by evoking Hamlet, one more thing between heaven and earth that we cannot understand a quote that he uses over and over again whenever the theme of the occult arises. <clears throat> and then he sets out in detail the chance-based numerological superstition which had led him to believe that he would die between the ages of 61 and 62. He was then age 53. A fear which he links to his former friend Wilhelm Fleece because the superstition erupted in the year of his attack on me. That would have been nine years earlier in 1900. Fleece's occult inflected theories of periodicity, number, bisexual polarity, and his resolute insistence that a kernel of truth lies behind every absurd popular belief were a lifelong influence on Freud, despite the final breakdown of their relationship in 1904. Jung had rather cryptically alluded to the Fleece analogy in his letter in the context of his own spookery, so perhaps he had intuited, or he and Freud had discussed, a hint of repetition of the Freud Fleece transference in his own relationship with Freud. Both Jung and Fleece, and indeed Freud himself, had something of the magician about them. A decade later, uh, in 1919, Freud alluded obliquely to the same numerological superstition in his study of the Unheimliche or uncanny. If, he says, we come across the same number, let us say 62. Multiple times in different contexts, we feel this to be uncanny and may attribute a secret meaning to it. We will take it perhaps as an indication of the span of life allotted to us. As Jones says, Freud writing of the uncanny was laying bare to himself the deep psychological origin of his own superstitious tendencies. Freud was then age 63 and so had outlived his predicted death. Or perhaps he felt he was in a sense already a ghost. <clears throat> Freud, in a 1921 paper, Psychoanalysis and Telepathy, which he shared only with his closest colleagues, the manuscript is on the left of the picture, writes, it no longer seems possible to keep away from the study of what are known as occult phenomena, of facts that is that profess to speak in favour of the real existence of psychical forces other than the human and animal minds with which we are familiar or that seem to reveal the possession by those minds of faculties hitherto unrecognized. The impetus towards such an investigation seems irresistibly strong, nor is there much doubt as to the origin of this trend. It is a part expression of the loss of value by which everything has been affected since the world catastrophe of the Great War, a part of the tentative approach to the Great Revolution towards which we are heading and of whose extent we can form no estimate but no doubt this is also an attempt at compensation, at making up in another, a super mundane sphere for the attractions which have been lost by life on this earth. He links the occult both to past trauma, the First World War, and impending societal transformation, the great revolution towards which we are heading and of whose extent we can form no estimate. He goes on to talk about the disturbing and disorienting effects of the recent scientific discoveries of radium and relativity. <coughs> He says that occultism and psychoanalysis 
have both experienced the same contemptuous and arrogant treatment by official science. That is, they both constitute what James Webb and, and Walter Hanegraaff would later call rejected knowledge. Psychoanalysis is dismissed by many, Freud says, as savouring of mysticism, and its unconscious is looked upon as one of the things between heaven and earth which philosophy refuses to dream of. Occultists would like to treat psychoanalysis as half belonging to them, as an ally against the dead hand of scientific authority. And psychoanalysis itself stands in opposition to everything that is conventionally restricted, well established and generally accepted. Not for the first time would it be offering its help to the obscure but indestructible surmises of the common people against the obscurantism of the educated opinion. Alliance and cooperation between analysts and occultists might thus appear both plausible and promising. But on the other hand, he characterizes occultists as convinced believers who are looking for confirmation in contrast to psychoanalysts who are content with fragmentary pieces of knowledge and with basic hypotheses lacking preciseness and ever open to revision. Analysts are at bottom incorrigible mechanists and materialists, even though they seek to avoid robbing the mind and spirit of their still unrecognized characteristics. So we have a complex picture of Freud, wary of the occult and yet in some sense drawn to it, perhaps even a fellow traveler with it. Freud wryly embraces their shared status as rejected knowledge. We might also think of Michael Barkun's idea of stigmatized knowledge, which he applies to conspiracy theory and which Christopher Partridge associates with occulture. And the three principles which Barkun identifies as, cause, as core to all conspiracy theories. Nothing happens by accident. Nothing is as it seems. Everything is connected. Psychoanalysis applies similar principles in its own distinctive way, finding meaning in the detritus of life, in dreams, jokes, slips of the tongue, failed prophecies, odd coincidences, things forgotten, repetitions, delays. Psychoanalysis is the science that deals with the permeability of personal boundaries in the face of unconscious events, writes Stephen Frosch. As infants and children, we identify with our caregivers and other key figures and incorporate them or our versions of them into our psyches. And these processes continue throughout our adult lives. The psychoanalyst Joan Revere in 1952 beautifully enunciates the Kleinian view of the individual as a world in himself, a company of many. But Frosch reveals the uncanny dimension of these incorporative processes, drawing on Jean Laplanche's notion of the enigmatic messages which the infant receives from its caregivers and Julia Kristeva's assertion that we are strangers to ourselves. He emphasizes the unheimlich nature of our sense of disquieting strangeness and otherness within. John Boyle speaks of esoteric traces in psychoanalysis and regards the esoteric as a kind of enigmatic message or foreign body intergenerationally transmitted and embedded within psychoanalysis itself. The uncanny can thus be seen as a stranger to and constitutive of the self in society. There is no such thing as a single human being, pure and simple, unmixed with other human beings, says Revere. But both psychoanalysis and the uncanny offer a challenge to the model of the liberal subject as an autonomous and self-reliant agent who makes his or her own destiny. <clears throat> as Freud warns us in 1917, the ego is not master in its own house. Freud saw resemblances between paranoia, superstition, religion, and philosophical systems, noting their similarities with and differences from psychoanalysis itself. <clears throat> Everything he, the paranoic, observes in other people is full of significance. Everything can be interpreted. But isn't that true also of the analyst? But what is hidden from him, the superstitious person, corresponds to what is unconscious for me. And the compulsion not to let chance count as chance, but to interpret it is common to both of us. Is psychoanalysis an occult science? I'd rather formulate that question in terms of what significance we can draw from Freud's connections with esotericism. For James Webb, psychoanalysis is sec secularized occultism. I suggest that psychoanalysis has become a sort of dark twin to psychology. 
despite its own, um, well, uh, sorry, dark twin to psychology, despite its own esoteric entanglements, psychology has largely disowned its associations with and origins in the occult, projecting its own disowned elements onto and into the depth psychologies. Psychoanalysis has repeated that process. Jungian analytical psychology is the dark twin of psychoanalysis, the place of spookery. But psychoanalysis has also provided a language, a system of myth and metaphor, and an experiential frame, which have richly facilitated the exploration of the unconscious, both personal and intersubjective, a zone which of necessity eludes colonization by rational and scientific discourse. And psychoanalysis shares with some currents of esotericism an initiatic approach to self-transformation, which roots change in engagement with the other and with the edge lands between inner and outer worlds. As chronicled by Eric Davis, Robert Anton Wilson talked about a place called Chapel Perilous. When you're in Chapel Perilous, there are only two ways out. You either come out a stone cold paranoid or a radical agnostic. Some may see strands of paranoia and of radical agnosticism in the psychoanalytic and occult projects. In my ongoing work, I'm exploring the roles of magic, other worlds, witches, ghosts, demons, and paranoia as metaphors in Freud's writing, which are constitutive of his theory building. Thank you very much. <laughs>